One of the all-time great songwriters, King David, posed a lyrical question in one of his songs. It's found in Psalm 10. And he asked this question, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And David was expressing what many have thought. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Or I even think, why does God allow bad things to happen to God's people? The Bible is a written history of people facing adversity. In the Old Testament, we see that Adam and Eve, it began with them facing adversity and difficulty. And then the prophets of God, Elijah and Elisha, on to Malachi, all through the Old Testament. And then into the New Testament, we see the followers of Jesus under Roman rule, which at times could be very cruel and resistant to the message that they were trying to bring. We see Peter, James, and John, and then Paul and beyond, even right up into our current day and age, we learn that adversity is not the exception to the rule. Adversity is the rule. It's what we need to learn to deal with. And God has a purpose in that adversity. God has a purpose in our trials. And that's what I'd like to encourage you in today with four things in particular to keep in mind as you face adversity. Jesus acknowledged this fact himself when he said, while you are in the world, you will have tribulation. You've heard me say this many, many times. In Jesus' day, there was a, a device called a tribulum, and it was used to separate uh, grain and various forms of grain, the grain from, from the chaff. And so you see a picture of that there on the screen. And it, uh, they would take heavy pieces of wood and they would carve uh, little sections out in it and put sharp pieces of rock, stone, various things in there so that as the weight of, of that tribulum was drawn over the grain, it would begin to, to break up the chaff and separate that from the heavier grain. And then, of course, they would take what they called winnowing forks and they would uh, put that on the threshing floor put the tribulum over it, and then they would take those threshing forks, throw the, all of that mess up into the air. The wind would blow the chaff away. The grain that was heavier that they wanted to keep would fall back to the threshing floor, and they would do that over and over and over again until they got exactly what it was that was most valuable. And really that does give us an imagery of what God does in our lives and how God can use adversity and trials and difficulty uh, to bring out something precious in all of our lives. Sometimes it takes difficulty and adversity to help us to realize things that really don't matter, that we include so much in our life, and what really does matter. And so that's why I wanted you to get this imagery this morning as we address this question. So the question isn't if trials will come, but the question is how will you handle them when they do come? Obviously, most people's natural reaction is we want to run from our problems and from trials and troubles because they're not pleasant. David also expressed this in a, in a song that he wrote. In Psalm 55, beginning at verse 4, he says this, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, if I only had wings like a dove, I, I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. So that's the honest feelings we have. But God doesn't want you and I to run from our problems. He wants us to learn from them. And he wants us to know how to face them and then how to overcome them. Because Jesus is the great overcomer and God wants you and I as his followers, Jesus wants you and I as his followers to be overcomers and we cannot be overcomers if we have never faced anything in our life to overcome. 
it's easy to want to say that and to talk it and to put it out there as an inspiring thing, but the fact is, if we're going to be an overcomer, then we have to be willing to face trials and difficulties and actually get through them. And that is why Jesus said in John 16, 33, his words are recorded, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, you'll have trouble, difficulty, adversity, but be of good cheer, take courage, I have overcome the world. And so by the strength that he gives us to overcome, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So Jesus, as the great overcomer, offers his presence and his promises and even his purposes in the trials. And this is the first thing that we need to understand as we look at the purposes of trials and how can I get through those trials. The first thing is God wants us to get control of our thinking. And it's easier said than done. But sometimes, you know, when we read in the scriptures, it can say something and, and we think, well, that just doesn't really make sense. How in the world, uh, you know, they make it sound so easy in the scriptures. But James addresses this. And so he's writing this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And he says this. So think of it in this way. He's talking about getting control of your thinking. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So James is not saying that trials and difficulties are joyful. He's not saying that we have to be happy about it and just happy-go-lucky and say, oh, well, whatever. But what he is saying, when he says count it all joy, literally that word count means to get control of, have rule over, get control of your thinking and fight off those feelings of desperation and fear and anger and all of that stuff that's natural, natural to our human condition. And we need to get control of ourselves in that moment. And the only way that we can get really get control of that is to go to a source that is more powerful than we are. And that source, of course, is Christ and his Holy Spirit. We need to look to others who are filled with the Spirit of Christ who can come along and encourage us. We need to look at his word to encourage us. And so that's what James is saying. Consider it joy, count it joy when you fall into various trials. Get control of your thinking and understand the positive things. Even though this is difficulty, uh, that you're going through now, realize the positive things that can come out of this if you handle it right. And then that's, that's what he goes on to say in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith, if you handle it right, if you count it all joy, if you get control of your thinking, the testing of your faith produces patience. There is a purpose in these problems. Faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now I mentioned a moment ago about the things that we would like to continue to do for the facilities here at Porterfield and for our ministry and the use of the property as a ministry tool to be a blessing to the community. This is not about building some fancy place for us to just come to, have a good time, feel good about life, and then go on with uh, whatever we want to do after we leave this place. This is Mission Outreach. This facility has been built for the glory of God. It's a training center. It's a place for people to come and hear the word of God taught and to see the love of Christ displayed as we gather here. And then as we prepare to go back out into our homes and our neighborhoods and our businesses and our jobs, our communities, we are carrying the spirit of Christ with us. This is not the church. We've said this many times. This building, this facility, this property is not the church. You and I are the church. This is simply the place where we gather. It's, it's our, our gathering place. It's, our, it's kind of the, the center of operations. It's an outpost where we come. But we also want to use this property to be a blessing to the community. And over the years, with the many things that we have faced, the challenges that we have faced, they have not been easy. Even now, as we're wanting to develop this field and we really want to get going on it, we want to make sure in wisdom we're doing the right things, not just rushing into a decision, doing some kind of an action, and then later saying, why didn't we take a little more time and do this right? So that's the process that we're 
going through right now as a church. And it's difficult, but that patience, as we go through these trials, as we wait on God's timing, it will help us to be complete, lacking nothing. God has a purpose in our problems, and that's what James means when he says we've got to consider it joy. The other thing that he says there in verse 2 is falling into various trials. That word in the original Greek when he wrote it that's translated into English, fall into, gives a word picture there. It gives the idea of a ship sailing on the ocean, coming maybe toward the shoreline, and it cannot see a sandbar that's just underneath the surface of the water, and the hull of that ship hits a sandbar, and now all of a sudden it's stuck, and it begins to get in peril. So the word picture there, it also can mean if you are just on a journey or a trip in life and a gang of robbers or thieves come and they all of a sudden attack you. It's something you weren't expecting and now you're in the midst of this difficulty. Doesn't that really describe the way a lot of problems in life are? We're just going along and everything seems fine and then all of a sudden you have a health issue or uh, someone in your family has something going on in their life that affects you personally. Sometimes, though, we also understand that we need to think about why these trials come if we're really going to properly learn from them because sometimes trials and hardships can come as a result of our own bad behavior and bad choices that we make. Sometimes it comes, as I mentioned, by the behavior of others, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And then some hardships simply come as a result of natural forces that are at work in the world like health issues or those kinds of things but then also there is a dynamic that we cannot see with our physical eyes that can also bring trials and hardships and that's the spiritual forces that are at work constantly all around us just like we cannot see oxygen in the air but we breathe it it surrounds us there is a spiritual realm that is constantly at work all around us and in us and through us, and we have to be aware of that. And sometimes those trials can come as a, re as a result of spiritual warfare that is going on. And that's why we need the help of Christ to get us through the trials of life. It's easy to follow Christ when everything's going well, but when things get difficult, that's when we really need to get control of our thinking and see things from God's perspective. That's why uh, the Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 16, that we need to learn to see things from God's perspective. I'll just read it to you. You see the reference on the screen if you want to jot it down and read it later for yourself, but I'll go through this quickly. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Paul is talking about the spiritual dynamic, the spiritual realm in the world, and a way that we can get control of our thinking and learn to see things uh, from Christ's perspective. These things we also speak, not in words which is, uh, men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. There are, that's why there are many people who will mock Christian believers or really people that have any kind of thoughts of spirituality. It's the natural man, their natural thinking. It's why there's a mindset in the world today, in science and everywhere else that tries to explain how we got here without God because they just cannot even comprehend the thought that there is a God, that God exists. So their worldview is going to be to try to explain how we got here without God. But if you are open to the consideration that there is a God, and you begin to look at life through that worldview, now it begins to help us see things differently. And this is what the Apostle Paul is teaching. These things we also speak not in words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. For who can know the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? That's a quote from uh, the scriptures. But then Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that somehow God just uh, does a, a transplant and he puts the mind of Jesus inside each one of us? I don't believe that's what he's talking about there. What he's saying is God 
sent Christ into the world that we might see things from the one true God's perspective, that we might know how to face difficulties and trials in life, and so that we might know that God is real and that he cares for us and he's done something about our sinful condition through giving his life on the cross for us and rising again so that through faith in Christ we know that we have a hope not only in this life but beyond this life. We were created for more than we could ever imagine but we have to have faith in him. And the only way that we can have the mind of Christ is if Christ has come into the world and taught us his viewpoint, his perspective. So how do you get the mind of Christ? You get it by reading his teaching that's been recorded and kept for us down through the ages. And the mind of Christ is relevant in every generation. It's why the things that Jesus taught about are still so relevant today, just like we're talking about blessings in a backpack, reaching out with love to those who are in need. That is a concept of Christ. And having the mind of Christ carries out these kinds of things in the world, but it also helps us when we face adversity and difficulty. 2 Corinthians 10.5, the Apostle Paul says this, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It has to be intentional. Following Jesus doesn't just happen as you stumble along in life and just stumble upon him, and then you don't just unintentionally follow him. Following Jesus is intentional. It's not easy. That's why every week we meet here and we encourage one another to say, what do we need to do to recorrect the path that we're on? When you drove here this morning, very obvious statement, but we don't think about it. When you drove here this morning, you spent your entire journey in the vehicle. If you were behind the wheel, you spent your entire journey here correcting your course. There's not a single one of you that just hopped in your car and, and started it up and pressed the gas pedal and said, okay, whatever happens, happens, I'm going to get there. That would have ended up in you crashing. And I know they're working on the technology now for Google to have self-driving vehicles. I get it. But if you're listening and if you're watching, maybe someday they'll have the technology, but we've heard in the news about the gentleman that died because he was trusting in that technology. We've got to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit and him working in and through us, and then we need to intentionally correct our course constantly through life if we want to be where God wants us to be as we trust his power to work within us. So quickly, here it is. Four things that can help us to understand why bad things happen to God's people and also how we can get through trials, what we can learn from them. Number one, trials can develop our character and our spiritual maturity. Again, in verse 3 uh, and 4, James says, the testing of your faith produces patience or perseverance. Let patience or perseverance have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature, in other words, complete, lacking nothing. So as you go through the trials and the difficulties, those trials are opportunities for you to exercise your faith just like we need physical exercise for our muscles to develop and grow and stay strong, we continually need to exercise those muscles. So it is spiritually. And trials in our life is a form of spiritual exercise. It's not pleasant, it can be painful, but it can produce a good result if you get control of your thinking and you understand what the possible outcome will be. Hebrews 10.36 says you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he promised. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. Think about this. There are many people in the world who over the years and still do will pay a lot of money for beautiful pearls. And the more beautiful, and I'm talking about natural pearls. Those pearls that are formed naturally are much more valuable than fake pearls. Why? Because those pearls are a result of the way that particular oyster dealt with something that got under its skin. I mean, literally, a pearl is a result of how an oyster dealt with a painful trial difficulty in its life. That 
grain of sand got into the shell and got under its skin and it formed an irritation. And the better the oyster was able to deal with that and form a protective coating over it, that's, that's how pearls are formed. And we'll take those that are most beautiful and say, wow, this is really valuable. And then we wear them as jewelry. Well, think of it in that way. The particular trial that you're going through in your life right now, the better you handle it, and with the, the better way that you handle it, it will come out on the other side as something more and more be beautiful. And it really is developing you into a person of great spiritual maturity and worth. Number two, trials prepare us for greater service, for use, for his glory. Familiar story in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where David faced Goliath. Well, before David faced Goliath, he had gone through some trials in his life that were very difficult when he was a lot, uh, well, he was a young boy when he faced Goliath, but even younger than that. And so again, I want to read this just quickly uh, for you, and you'll get the point. But we read this in 1 Samuel 17, 32. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine, talking about Goliath. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a youth. David was uh, likely a teenager. Uh, we don't know how old, maybe 17, 18, I don't know, 19, somewhere in there. But he was a, a young man. You are a youth. And he has been a man of war since his youth. But David said to Saul, here it is, listen to this, because here's the lesson we learn. Your servant, talking about himself, David said, used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Now that's an amazing feat. But what David was saying is, Saul, I've been through some rough times in my life. I know I'm facing a big enemy here, but you know, I learned some lessons in life when I was watching over the flock trying to protect my dad's livelihood. And when a lion came in, which is a pretty serious beast, or a bear, God gave me strength to overcome that challenge, that difficulty in my life back then. And even though this is a much more serious thing in my life now, you know what? I believe God's going to give me strength to do this because he got me through that. Can I hear an amen? In your life, when you go through trials, God is preparing you. If you will handle it right, if you will trust his power, if you will get through it by his power and his strength, he'll not only get you through that and help you be an overcomer, and that'll be good, and you'll learn and you'll begin to mature, but he's also going to prepare you then to do some greater things for his glory. Don't let that scare you to say, oh no, what's he going to throw on me next? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he's going to give you confidence and the ability to overcome uh, and to be used in even greater ways. Well, golf balls, when they were first manufactured, they were manufactured with a smooth cover. But what they found is after they used those golf balls for a while and they were whacking them with the clubs and knocking them down the fairway or wherever they went, that after those golf balls got some nicks in the cover of it, they started noticing that they were getting more distance out of the golf balls with the nicked up covers. And so guess what? That's why today golf balls are manufactured with all those little dimples in them. Because they understand that something that's roughed up a little more can go further. You get more distance out of it. In your life, every little trial, every little difficulty that you learn to get through and overcome can help you actually get further in life. It is a physical principle, but I believe it's a spiritual principle as well. Number three, trials equip us to help others who will go through the same type of trials. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation or trouble, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Here it is, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. When we get a hold of our thinking and control of it and when we face it with the right attitude, trusting Christ, realizing he's developing us and that he's not out to destroy us but to develop us and we begin to learn to overcome those trials and those difficulties and persevere and that he's equipping us for greater things, 
in the trial that we go through, we now can come along somebody else that's going through a similar kind of thing and we can let them know, I really do at least understand a little bit about what you're going through. How many times in your life have you gone through something, a pain, a difficulty, and then later encountered somebody that was going through a similar thing? It happened with me growing up. My mother developed breast cancer. She had to go through many surgeries. I saw what that did to her physically, emotionally, spiritually. And at the time, I prayed. I didn't understand why God was allowing her to suffer and to go through all of these things. She battled depression. She battled many different things. And I prayed and I asked God to take that away from her. And God, I don't understand why. But I'm standing here today to tell you, and by the way, that God did answer prayer. And I saw my mother mature through those things. I saw her come to a point of her faith deepening until right before, a few days before she drew her last breath, she said, Mark, I'm, I'm ready now. I'm ready. It gives me great comfort. In fact, one of the scripture verses that she quoted a few days before she died, she said, I just keep thinking about that verse in Isaiah, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Man, I'm so glad God put that in her mind and her heart to speak before she passed because her passing was not easy. She had a difficult time and that was difficult for me to watch and to see. But the thing is, all those things that I saw my mother go through has helped me countless times when people, people come to me and they say, Mark, my mother is very ill or she's going through a tough time. It helps me to at least have some empathy and to understand from their perspective what that feels like even though I don't know exactly how people feel I can relate it also helped me when my own wife was diagnosed with breast cancer it helped me to understand what she might be going through and what she might face and it helped me to pray for her and to know how to be there by her side and to support her church I'm telling you the trials that you're going through now they're very difficult and they're painful but God is preparing you and he can help you to minister to others with the same strength that he's giving you right now if you'll have the right attitude. And that brings us to the fourth and most important thing. Trials remind us of our need to rely on God. The Apostle Paul, he went through the same thing. The Apostle Paul was a man who through the power of the Holy Spirit was healing other people. Other people who had physical ailments we're experiencing the healing of Christ through the Holy Spirit working through Paul. And yet Paul himself was afflicted with some type of physical ailment. We don't know what it was. He just refers to it in his writings as a thorn in the flesh. But listen to what the Apostle Paul writes about this trial that he was going through, this physical affliction. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure... By the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Paul even saw there was a spiritual battle that was going on and that it was really Satan who was behind this, but God was permitting it because, again, God in his love and his wisdom was teaching Paul something through this. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. How many of you sitting here today, maybe you're right here today and you're saying, but Mark, yeah, you're telling me all this stuff and it sounds okay, but why is it I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and my situation isn't changing? I've prayed and God still not answered my prayer in the way that I want him to, to answer. Okay, this is for you. This part right here of the message is for you. Because this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me and he said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. That's what I'm trying to teach you. With everything that you've done in life and your accomplishments, I still want you to understand where you are in the order of things. And I do love you and I haven't forgotten you. And I know you're hurting, but Paul, I want you to continue to trust, not in your own power, but you've got to trust in my power working in you. I don't want you to ever forget who I am because I'm your creator, I'm your redeemer, and I do love you. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And when Paul realized that, he said, therefore, most gladly, I, I rather boast in my infirmities. Hmm, what was it that James said we should do? Count it all what? Count it all joy. Get control of your thinking. So we're seeing right here an early follower of Christ 
that was listening to the advice of other apostles and what God was teaching them. Paul had to get control of his thinking and he said, you know, I prayed for this thing three times and I was feeling pretty sorry and aggravated and I had to get control of my thinking and God reminded me his grace is sufficient for me. Therefore, I'm going to count it all joy. I'm going to trust God's plan. I would rather boast in my infirmities than the power of, uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4.11, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means I can get through this trial by Christ who strengthens me. And not to sound fatalistic, but if you have a faith in Christ, and you end up dying in the midst of your trial, do you know that you have not lost? You have not lost, you have won. You have shown that you are the great overcomer because the scripture says nothing can separate us from the love of God, demonstrated in Christ Jesus. Not life, not death, not trials, tribulations, persecutions, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God demonstrated through our Lord Jesus Christ because Christ is the great overcomer. So if we can get control of our thinking, we really can begin to look at our difficulties and our trials in a more positive way. Here's the recap real quick. Realize God's purpose in the face of trials is to develop your character and your spiritual maturity to prepare you for greater service and use for his glory, to equip you to help others going through the same trials, and to remind you of your need to constantly rely on Christ. Would you stand with me? This morning as we close, as we sing our closing song, as always, it's an opportunity for you. If In this moment, if, if the Lord's speaking to you and you just like to pray before you walk out these doors, you have an opportunity to do that. I'd be happy to pray with you if you'd like me to do that. If you just want to take some time to come off to the side here and kneel down and pray, or you can do that, of course, after the service ends here. But right now in this moment is an, is an opportunity to really think about how I'm going to respond to this message today and how God wants to use it in your life. Father, thank you for your constant presence and promises in Christ. And thank you for the power that you give us in Christ to overcome our difficulties and our trials. I pray now... Heavenly Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Christ, that every one of us who are here today dealing with various trials and difficulties, that you will use these moments by the power of your Holy Spirit to strengthen, encourage us, and to help us uh, to know how to respond, to get through and overcome these things that we face in your name. Amen.